Parliament has declared martial law in part of the country. It's a response to Russia's capture of three Ukrainian naval vessels over the weekend. Russian ships also took crew members prisoner. President Petro Poroshenko warned of extremely serious threat of a land invasion. And Moscow is blaming Kiev for the crisis, as Evelyn Laverick reports. <laughs> Ukraine's parliament has backed imposing martial law for 30 days in parts of the country most vulnerable to attack from Russia. Lawmakers approved the move after President Petro Poroshenko reassured some skeptics that it would not be used to curb civil liberties or delay elections scheduled for next year. As president and as commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Ukraine, I fulfilled my constitutional duty and a few hours ago, by my decree, introduced martial law. Russia has been conducting hybrid war against our country for the fifth year, but by attacking Ukrainian military boats it moved on to a new stage of aggression. Poroshenko cited the threat of invasion following Sunday's clash off the coast of Crimea. Russia first fired on three Ukrainian naval vessels and then seized them and 23 crew members. Ukraine said it was a Russian act of aggression. Moscow said the ships had illegally entered its waters. The Ukrainian ships had been trying to enter the Sea of Azov from the Black Sea via the narrow Kerch Strait that separates Russia-annexed Crimea from the Russian mainland. Moscow was downplaying the worsening relations with Kiev. <laughs> It may be that while Ukraine was planning this provocation, and no one has any doubt that this was done with the goodwill and probably a direct order from the highest leadership of Ukraine, that they were counting on additional benefits that they wanted to get out of the situation. First of all, they were counting on the fact that the US and Europe, as always, will recklessly take the side of the provocateurs. In parts of Ukraine, there's obviously some anxiety about the hike in tensions with Russia. Children have even been mobilized to help adults strengthen a coastal line of defense. They say it's a reasonable precaution in case of attack. Evelyn Lavrik, Euronews. Well, our correspondent Natalia Lyubchenkova is in Mariupol uh, near the Azov Sea, and she sent us this update. Mariupol is a southern industrial city in the western Donetsk region that stands on the Sea of Azov. It's just right behind my back. It's running over there to its port. The Ukrainian vessels were heading before they were seized by Russia near the annexed Crimea. Mariupol also experienced the heavy shelling back in January 2015. 30 civilians were killed then, and the buildings uh, stand damaged today in the same... They are in the same state they were after the shelling, at least some of them. So we can see can still see the clear signs of war still present here. Nevertheless, it was more than that exact shelling was more than three years ago, and the sense of security grew since then. So now we have this situation. Although the atmosphere in the city seems to be normal and people behave as normal, uh, they are terrified, they are scared. And not only in the region, now they, uh, they all, it also spreads um, all across Ukraine. Uh, probably. Now the epicenter of the panic is uh, on social media, of course, there is a great sense of anger towards Russia, despair, and um, this not again feeling. But you can still see the situation uh, has changed, uh, has influenced uh, what, was hap what is happening here right now. On the way here through the Donetsk region, I have seen the signs of uh, Ukrainian army being on full alert as it was announced. Also here in Mariupol, there were people who went to reinforce the coastline of defense to strengthen the trenches on the coast of the sea. Local people here in the Donetsk region, volunteers and aid workers, uh, they uh, they don't know yet how to react to this situation and they don't know what it brings. Some of them already work um, on the contact line for a really long time, um, so they are basically um, exploring this war situation, they're helping people affected uh, by war, so they're really now into this martial law um, that was introduced, trying to understand how their situation will change right now. We've heard a lot about the struggle that Theresa May is going to face getting this deal uh, through Parliament. Any signs that that struggle might be made a little bit easier for her? No, 
quite frankly, Belle, uh, it's not going to be made any easier for her. Uh, 24 hours is now a very long time in British politics. Theresa May returned to Downing Street yesterday morning, having got that deal through the EU. There was no time to celebrate. We're told yesterday morning's Cabinet meeting was all about the no-deal Brexit planning. So it shows the lack of confidence in getting this through the House of Commons. Theresa May then went to the House and she saw the strength of feeling for herself. There was barely any support for her deal on her own backbenches. MP after MP got up, including former loyalists like Lieutenant Michael Fallon, the Defence Secretary who served under Theresa May. He got up and criticised the deal. There was no support across the opposition benches. Last night, Downing Street actually put on an event for Labour MPs to try to get them on board. We're told only about 25, 26 of them turned up. So there is really no maths now for Theresa May to get this through the Commons. So she pivots to Operation Hard Sell. She had around 100 business leaders here in Downing Street last night. She was trying to convince them of her deal so that they would put pressure on MPs. And then she embarks on this tour today, going to Wales and Northern Ireland to try to convince people there of her deal. But then last night, President Trump, he decided to step in. Here's what happened. Sounds like a great deal for the EU. And I think we have to do this. Uh, I think we have to take a look at seriously whether or not the uh, UK is allowed to trade because, you know, right now, if you look at the deal, they may not be able to trade with us. Now, after getting through that day, that is the last thing Theresa May needed. There is a news grid in there. It is a complex arrangement, a schedule for the next couple of weeks, trying to plot through everything Theresa May will need to do. She's going to do lots of media appearances. She apparently has now agreed in principle to a TV debate the Sunday before the vote on the 11th. But the last thing that she needed was Donald Trump stepping in like that to criticise her deal. He did make some valid points, not in very helpful terms about the limitations the UK might face now with the arrangement it struck with the EU. But she's going to go to the G20 later this week in Buenos Aires. She's going to be trying to strike up uh, talks with deals with other nations. But she's also going to have to confront Donald Trump and try to say to him privately, I need you to back me. I don't think we'll be seeing anything like a Love Actually moment where she stands up to President Trump. But this is the last thing she really needed because she needs now to try to sell this deal before the 11th of December because at the moment she simply doesn't have the vote to get it through the House of Commons and then, well, all bets are off. She could be fighting to stay in that place there with her own party and she'll be fighting to get her deal through the Commons possibly for a second time because the EU has made clear, made clear to her there is no better deal than the one that you've got. Now, after a seven-month journey, a NASA probe has successfully landed on Mars, which is very risky. Uh, it carries a range of instruments, uh, many of them from Europe, and all of these are set to investigate what is beneath Mars's surface. Miguel Almaguer reports. Touchdown confirmed. <laughs> The successful landing of NASA's InSight marks the space agency's return to Mars, an $814 million mission that came down to a touchdown after traveling 300 million miles. We call it seven minutes of terror because you white knuckle it the whole time. Launching in May, the first mission to study the interior of Mars, InSight hit 3,000 degrees using a heat shield, parachute, and rockets to slow its descent from 12,000 to 5 miles an hour. What the team pulled off today is truly historic. Tonight, InSight has finished its harrowing journey, a first dusty look as it begins its groundbreaking work on Mars. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News.